I'm Shannon Moore, and this is Formation. Today we'll be chatting with someone who ran from a call to ministry, but caught up with her. Join us. Welcome to Formation, a weekly podcast from University Christian Church in Fort Worth, Texas, where each week I sit down with people and just talk about faith. Today, I am thrilled to have with us uh, the new Minister of Children and Families here at University Christian Church, Reverend Mariah Newell. Mariah, I didn't waste any time getting you (laughs) on the podcast. How long have you been here? I've been here two and a half weeks, maybe, yeah. almost three. Okay. So, yeah, it's uh, been a wonderful ride. Good, 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 good. And you came from here from? Cypress Creek Christian Church in Houston, Texas. All right, so still hot but more humid there. Yes, yes, and moved out during barrel with no power. So it was a welcome uh, adventure to be here with AC. <laughs> that sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the best move ever, but we were just glad to get here and make it. <laughs> and you say we. Tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah, so I, I'm married to a wonderful man, uh, Evan Tiffany, and uh, we share a son uh, who is nine months old on Saturday, August 3rd, uh, Carter Tiffany. A petite little thing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe. He's he's a large baby. Uh, actually, Kyle uh, met him two Sundays ago, and in staff meeting, uh, I said that he was nine months, and he said, I thought he was a toddler. <laughs> so he is a... Uh, Kyle, uh, our youth minister. Yes, yeah. Kyle, the youth he minister. He was ready to put him in the Cairo group, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, thank you for being here, and uh, just like to chat with you a little bit about faith, and I always, almost always start by asking about your childhood faith. If you grew up in church or if you didn't, um, what was that like for you? Yeah, so um, my mom and my stepdad are actually both ordained ministers. Um, my mom was ordained in the United Church of Christ. My stepdad, Sister to Christian Church, Disciples correct, of Christ. Correct. Uh-huh. And my stepdad is ordained in the Presbyterian Church. Um, Which we have roots of the Presbyterian exactly. Church. Exactly. Okay. And so... Um, you were I sort had, of destined to become uh, disciples okay. of Christ. Yes. <laughs> and long history in my mom's side of ministers. So I'm like the 10th generation. Uh, like, it's it's a wow. lot of, yeah, ministers. So I was kind of, um, yeah, destined. Was and your mom the first woman? I think, actually, she might have been. Okay. I, I don't know if I had thought about that. Well, my great grandmother, she never pastored a church, but she actually got her MDiv from University of Chicago in the 1920s. That's um, amazing. So that was really, she was an incredible woman. Okay. So, yeah. Um, but, so I grew up going to a Presbyterian church mostly because my stepdad was kind of the settled pastor. My mom uh, did a lot of interim work. She's now the first, uh, she's now the settled pastor at First Christian in Denton. Um, so she's nearby, but um, so I went to a lot of Presbyterian uh, things. I went to a UCC campground and a Disciples of Christ campground. Okay. Where uh, was going, this? Um, this was in uh, Central Texas. So I went to a camp in New Braunfels oh. and then Gonzales, Texas. All right. So. And were the, how, how were those camps formational for you in your faith development? Camp is the reason why I'm a minister. Um just I my parents divorced when I was about four years old and it was a very rough divorce Mm. Um, and so camp was the place where I was able to go and really pause and get to know God um, and get to hear the good news and by somebody who wasn't my parents you know (laughs) and being a preacher's kid and so I really experienced, you know, God's love and God's community in those spaces. And I felt my call to ministry first at camp. And my first big kid job after graduating from TCU was being the program director at Camp Moval in Missouri. Okay. And it's a Christian camp. It's United Church of Christ. And so um, it just, that was where I heard God most clearly in my life first. How, were, how old were you when you started going to camp? Oh, I was uh, six years old, oh and I haven't missed a summer of camp until this year. So it's been like 20-something years that I've been going to camp. Is it too late? 
you go find one? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it was just like almost, and even in COVID, we did these kind of online camps. So I, I still kind of count that. Of course. And so. Um, and we were all camping. Yes. <laughs> in our houses. <laughs> and, yeah. And um, so, yeah, it's, it, camp has just been a huge part of my life. It's where I met my husband. Okay. Actually, we uh, were high school campers together. Didn't date then, but then we went back to camp as I was co-directing, and he was a counselor, and we re-met. And in COVID, we got married at the campground where we met uh, at a parking lot wedding type of thing. So our parents pulled up. It was in May of 2020. They watched us get married, and um, so, yeah, we just decided we didn't want to wait and we went and got married at camp. I love that. Yeah. Can you tell me, I was not a camp kid, um, mm. so can you tell me how your experience at camp with worship and community was different from your regular church, which also has worship and community? And Yeah, I, I think part of it was anonymity. Um, I grew up in a small town, Llano, Texas, dear capital of Texas, if anybody knows it. But um, everybody knew about me. I graduated in class of 110. Everybody knew everybody's family. Everybody, you know, just knew things about your life. And so going to camp and being able to be quiet and not be the center and just, like, reflect was really great and have a little bit of that anonymity and also... Everybody kind of agrees that we're being a part of an experiment, whether we actively say it or not. And you're, you don't have your phone. You're not with your regular social groups. <clears throat> and so everybody is willing to kind of cross divides that sometimes doesn't happen on a Sunday morning for just an hour. Mm -hmm. Because you're there and you're immersed, it's like, okay, well, you do sports and I do band, but no, none of that matters here for a week, so mm -hmm. we can try being friends. And people, like, I saw and made friendships that were just with people I never would have made friends at school. Yeah. Because there wasn't anybody to kind of make that social check of like, no, you shouldn't. Um, it oh. was just, we were all kind of passively agreeing, okay, but we're going to try and see how this is like. I'm curious, and I guess there's no way to know for sure, but I'm curious what you think. If camp were to last longer than a week, if, yeah. if you were there for a month, yeah, do you think it could maintain that sort of special ingredient that makes it what it is or do you think you would start to I yeah I don't I think probably some of that would start to come in I think part of it being temporary is a factor of it um, and I think that that's okay you know I think that <clears throat> it gives it reminds us that it's possible mm -hmm. you know and so that y in the real world, you know, that you know that you can make those differences work. Mm -hmm. You know that it's possible. And so it's just a nice reminder when you're feeling hopeless or you're feeling lost that it's like, well, at camp it can work. And camp is God and God's everywhere. So it can work here. Like I can grab that camp energy and, and give it my best, you know, give it my best shot. I would guess um, that when you leave camp, there's a down. Yeah. <laughs> it's leaving the camp. Uh, you know, people say, like, you're leaving the camp high and, like, how to keep on with the camp mountaintop experience, that type of thing. And, you know, and part of that's just being around friends. Mm -hmm. You know, you wake up, you go to breakfast, you go to lunch, you do all these activities, and you're just around these people who not only are just, like, friends, but they they listen in small groups to the stuff that's going on in your life. You know, like I'm getting bullied at school and it really doesn't feel great. My parents are going through a divorce and it's really hard. I, you know, didn't get varsity on this team or I, our one act play didn't make it to state and it was really heartbreaking. Or this year was absolutely fantastic for me and I finally made progress in all these ways that I've been working on. And, and it really is like, what church is of doing life together and sharing together and being vulnerable together. Um, but it's just like a, it's a training for 
you know, young people to like know that that's possible. And then, and knowing that it's for just a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. you get the opportunity to sort of appreciate these are the good old days. Yeah. The, the, yeah. To really appreciate what you have for the time yeah. that you have it. And no, you can't hold on to everything permanently. Yeah. It's a good lesson, I think. Yeah, and then not everything about your faith is the mountaintop. You mm -hmm. know, Moses didn't stay there. <laughs> and, right. you know, like we have the, you know, Jesus wasn't there. For, you know, the disciples had to let go, mm -hmm. you know. And so we remember those times and they're, you know, spiritual, like recharging. Um, but, you know, then we go back and we try and make it last longer somewhere else. Well, we're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, we'll hear what happened to you later ah. in your life. Okay, so we'll be right back. Uh, we'll continue this conversation with Reverend, Reverend Mariah Newell. My role with the Acolytes on Sunday morning, it starts during the week. I email the parents of the 4th, 5th, and 6th graders um, to get their children signed up so that they can actually participate in the traditional worship at 1115. One of the significant things about working with them is seeing the face of the congregation when the acolytes really bring the light of Christ into the sanctuary and light the candles on the altar. And then once we've been to the table, once we've broken bread and we've heard an amazing message, we're to carry that light out into the community. And the acolytes are the very symbol that shows us that we're to take that message out, carrying the light of Christ into our community. We are back continuing our conversation with Reverend Mariah Newell. She is the Minister of Children and Families here at UCC. How did you get into ordained ministry? And I know you said that you experienced a call to ministry mm -hmm. at yeah. camp. How, how did you follow that, that call? Well, I ran from it for a long time. Really? <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I, I grew up with minister parents, so I knew what ministry looked like, uh, you know, the nitty gritty behind the scenes. Did your parents know that you were struggling with a call to ministry or did you not share that with them? They suspected and I always just said, no, I'm just not going to do that. And so they weren't surprised when it came together, you know. Were they encouraging of that or were were they yeah they just, are encouraging good. of that and they they've always been you know kind of my number one fans type of thing of you know and it's nice even little things like we have a very large stole closet you know that <laughs> oh, we get yeah. to, you yeah. know like we all get to share <laughs> you know and so it, and you know if we're working on a sermon and all doing lectionary we get to have our own little lectionary That's group great. and what a great know. idea um what did God do mm. or the Holy Spirit do yeah. to sort of hit you over the head with it and, and push you in that direction? Yeah, it was it was mostly uh, I took an internship at Cypress Creek Christian Church. Actually, when I was um, 21, I was at TCU. It was the, between my junior and senior year, and it was a summer youth ministry internship. I got the job. I didn't think that I would get it. I didn't think I was qualified at all. Um, and But I got the call, got the job. And then the, the youth minister called me two weeks later and said, hey, I've accepted another position and I'll be there for two weeks while you're there. And then I'm going to be gone. So you, but we think that you can run the summer. So you came in as an intern. Mm -hmm. You had a youth minister for two weeks, and then you were the youth minister. Exactly. And uh, I actually led a mission trip here to University Christian Church with a Cairo group, and then I led a mission trip to St. Louis, Missouri, and I had never been on a mission trip before. Um, so it was, uh, and then I directed camp for the first time that summer as well, and so it was kind of this very immersive experience into ministry. God really did hit you over the head. Yeah. And then, and then the funny part was, is after the summer, I was like, oh, that was great, but I'm not going to do that. Um, and still was, and then I came back, I had something happen with my schedule here at TCU. And the only class that would fit in my schedule was leadership and ministry. That was the only one that would fit. And I called my mom and I said, God is being very pushy with me right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, it, it was, 
after that summer, I knew. I still kind of tried to do other things. Um, I wanted to be a lawyer. I was a political science and English major. And um, it, it just, finally, uh, after MoVal, I knew that, or like, I was going to do ordained ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got the call to go back to Cypress Creek um, full-time and I took that, and then there were opportunities through Lexington Theological Seminary to keep my job there um, and do seminary. And so I was able to do what I loved and apply all this new learning to what I was doing. And so um, I really loved that I was able to do both at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it made for a hectic couple of years, for sure, but um, I really I really loved that opportunity. And in that role, you worked with children all the way through? I mean, all the way through 18. So it, my job, my role evolved over the years. So I wasn't always with kids, but I ended up with kids uh, about midway through. And then um, I did, you know, cribs, cradle all the way through 18. Mm-hmm. But those kids that graduated were still my kids, you know, so everybody who stayed in town was still, I was still doing stuff with them too and checking in on them and being their minister. So, you know, cribs to young adult. All right. Well, one of the things I like to talk about is, uh, especially with ministers, is spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines. How, what are some ways that you stay I'm reticent to say the word yeah. connected because I feel yeah. like we're always connected to God. But what are some ways that you stay connected in your faith? This year, I, I kind of pick something new so I can stay fresh. You know, um, not everything always works all the time. But this year, I've really been working on reading through the Bible in a year. Okay. And that kind of came out of being a new mom. And there was a lot of times I was just sitting and holding the baby. Um, And I have the Bible app on my phone and I can just follow a plan and read through the Bible. Um, So that was something that gave spiritual meaning beyond staring at this precious little human in my arms. Which is also great. Yeah. But also... But also, you know, that's a lot of time that you're sitting just holding. (laughs) So, you know, that was a nice way to add that in. I've also done things like, you know, really being intentional about praying for people um, during tragedy moments that I see on the news to try and really honor those lives. Um, I've, you know, gone through like watching different churches sermon series um, at different like disciples churches or UCC churches of, you know, preachers that I want to listen to more. Um, what does what is prayer like for you? What... Prayer is often in the car um, or in these kind of like pause moments. Um, and prayer is more of like a conversation for me with God. Mm-hmm. It's not usually like, dear God, I want to pray for so and so and their healing. It's just it's more of like, God, I, I'm i really thinking about so-and-so, and they're on my heart, and I know they're going through this cancer treatment, and I just I worry about this. And, and it's kind of just like telling my thoughts around how I'm seeing their situation, how I want to connect them to my heart. Mm. And well, that's beautiful. So, yeah, I just really, uh, prayers are, yeah, just conversations and, and really... And, and being thankful for the joys, you mm-hmm. know, of just like being able to sit in somebody else's joy for a minute. Yeah. So. And be grateful not only for your own yeah. gifts and, and things that you have, but for other people yeah. as well. I'm curious. Uh, I'm going to jump back yeah. to scripture for a second. If uh, in this new um, practice you have of going through the Bible in a year, yeah. has, is there anything that surprised you? Like, I didn't remember that, or I didn't realize that, or wow, I, you know. This. Yeah, yeah, I like that uh, it's helping connect the wider narrative in different ways. Um, I also, I think it's just funny, there's just like weird phrases that I've never like picked up on, but when you're reading it all together, you're like, why is that there? (laughs) And like, and I highlight it so that I can go, like that's also part of it, so that when I go back through after this year, I can be like, oh yeah, there was that weird phrase. Like there was one in Genesis of like, it was like he put his hand under his leg. And I'm like, what? 
<laughs> like, what does that mean? And like, I, I don't know. It, so it's on my list of going back and like doing a little bit of study of like, what is that cultural practice that, and what does that mean for, and why is that special? It obviously was added for a reason. Yeah, so why was it mentioned? what is it communicating or meaning to communicate? And um, so, yeah, that's been fun of like seeing how many little highlights of like weird phrasing or practices that I can go back and, uh, you know, and talk with kids about of like, yeah. oh, this is a funny thing that's in scripture. Let's talk about what it means. Like, it's kind of like making a pinky promise, you know, and being able to make those analogies and have it come to life for them. That's great. So not only is this a, a practice for you, but you're able to use it in your ministry yeah. with the kids. One of my favorite uh, weird phrases uh -huh. is from King James translation okay. <laughs> when Jesus raises Lazarus, uh -huh. Lazarus um, and it says, surely he stinketh. <laughs> <laughs> I just know that. That's one of my favorite things. Oh, I need to pull that for the kids. <laughs> Surely, that can be their memory verse one. <laughs> Surely he's stinking. And all the parents would be like, what are they learning? <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Well, Mariah, we are just about out of time, but yeah. I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing a little bit of your life and your ministry yeah. with us. And we're so excited to have you here on staff. And I know it's going to be a great year for our children and families and hope that uh, you just have a great fall mm -hmm. coming up. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for watching. If you would like to share your story on formation, send me an email, formation at uccftw.com. I would love to hear from you. Take care.